welcome back. You're a very unusual person if you don't sometimes wish, as they say, to get away from it all. But you would be even more unusual, and you certainly wouldn't be watching this programme, if you were to do it not for a week or two, but permanently, 365 days a year, in a deliberate attempt to escape as completely as possible from the 20th century. But if you go, as we will in a moment, to a valley in South Wales, you'll find there a group of people who seem intent on breaking out of our civilization. To find out how and why, a first Tuesday team has been there, and this, the valley, is what they found. M25 at Junction 24, that's Potter's Bar, of course. The slip road is closed coming east. I live with the land where I am, and I drink from the mountain stream. We're trying to get back to our mother, you see, away from your optical dream. Where you're standing in life just sits in the bank, invested in bombs and weapons and tanks. Your politics confuse me, and so does your law. I don't live in your heavens, I sleep on the floor. Our mother's in trouble, the pollution's too much. We're losing our senses, we're losing our touch. This is a unique place in Britain, I would say. It's a very special place. Roughly. There was about 100 people live in the valley at the moment, although that changes. People go away, people come, but there's a stable population of about 100. People come from all over, come from abroad, come from Germany, France, all the cities of Britain. We own quite a bit of the land, and the people put money into this trust that buys the land for them to live on. And I suppose we own quite, quite a large portion of the valley at this point in time. And who knows, in a few years we'll probably be farming the land. I started off working on the fishing fleet from Hull when I was 15. I worked in a supermarket. I worked in several supermarkets. I was dead end jobs going nowhere. Uh, I came here about four, four and a half years ago. Things seem to be pushing me towards it. I'd split up with a girlfriend. The lease on the house I was living in was running out. There's no way I could afford to get another one. But I had been working as a dispatch rider in Reading. Somebody pinched me bike. I'm something of a hermit, I suppose. I tend to keep it to myself, which is, is OK here. There's enough space. I lived in London, in Brixton. I uh, wasn't doing very much, really. A uh, single parent, a council flat, taking Valium and... Uh, I was having such a terrible time in the city that uh, I was desperate for any way out, really. I, I couldn't cope with it any longer. There's no relation to the sort of person I am now, the sort of person I was in the city. I think I've become calmer, definitely calmer. While I lived in a city, I didn't see having children as being a good thing to do. Whereas here, I definitely feel it's a fulfilment of my role, if you like. Yeah, it's a fulfilment of my person to live here and have children. See this little foot? This little piggy went to market. This little piggy went to town. This little piggy ate roast beef. And this little piggy had none. And this little piggy went wee. Oh, I had. I think the experience of living like this in the valley changes everybody completely. It doesn't just change you, 
psychologically and emotionally, but even physically. You have to get used to being at the uh, will of the elements, as it were. You have to get used to the fact that your lifestyle depends upon your environment. If you live in a city and it gets dark, you can switch on the light. If you live in a teepee and it gets dark, you go to bed. Um, if it's raining, it's raining and, you know, for the first six months you bash your head against the wall, but eventually you just get used to the fact that if it's going to rain, it's going to rain. I was, for a while, I was a gardener at a stately home and uh, everything was done very precisely, you know, like all the borders were cut finely and all the flowers were planted in little rows and it was all very structured. My garden now is not like that at all. It, I mean, it's just patches of vegetables growing amongst wild plants. But that process of letting go is very difficult. But when you do, you see that nature's making a much better job of it than you could, you know? I've never worked harder in my life. I mean, you take the trees out of the forest and you strip them and you make the canvas into the, the home that you live in. I worked with the BBC for about seven or eight years. I felt it was a, a rut. It didn't seem to be taking me very far. Wash it. Wash it with your hands. Personally, I think there's, there's some more important things happening, really, than just sort of your job, you know. I spent three years doing industrial photography. You know, it was a kind of trade, you know, a specialised job. But um, there was filters on the window and things like that. I don't know, you're just living in the dark, you know. And when it actually came to it, it wasn't important as sort of being someplace else. Hi, I mean, most fathers in the city, they have children, but they go out early in the morning and they come back late at night, right, generally speaking. They come back tired, and kids are more a nuisance than anything else if you want to relax. And here it isn't like that, you know, it's like, I have a lot of time for Plum. We have that kind of sharing thing together. Okay. You, have, you have space, you have time, you have access to a lot of nice things to give your children. I just think there are a lot of people who need a job to feel that they're worth anything. It doesn't tend to be something that happens in two people. You've got too much to do just to keep things together. It's, it's quite a hectic life. If you, if you want to live in any reasonable amount of comfort, you've got to work for it. We'd rather work for it, um, work for ourselves, than go out, work in a factory. But really, if you spend eight hours a day working, a couple of hours a day getting to work and back, eight hours a day sleeping, four hours a day sitting in front of the telly or going down to the pub, it's not something I can do. I've done it for, oh, 15 years, more than that. It's, it's not a life I want to lead. I'd much rather work for myself. If I want to be comfortable, I can be comfortable. Hello. How's you doing? Oh, staying dry, isn't it? Yeah, I'm sort of. Got a bit wet last night, though. On the whole, I think we're rather a nice bunch of people who try not to hurt anybody and take a bit of care of uh, over the life in general around us. Well, the way, the way that we live here feels dignified to me. It feels, yeah, it feels like a dignified existence. When I go back and I'm dependent on, on all the public services and I turn the tap on and the water comes out and I put the gas on and it, Kettle it's taken all the responsibility from me. Here I'm responsible for all of that. It's, that feels more right, it's more relevant. I don't want to take from the earth any more than I have to.
I came here with very vague intention. I didn't didn't really know what I was doing. I came here hoping to spend maybe six months here. Instead, I've stayed four years. I brought Luca here, who's my other son. He's now 14. And he lives next to us, but not in the same teepee. He has his own teepee, which he built himself. Luca's changed quite dramatically. He was quite a problem child when we lived in a city. It's not surprising. Um, very little to do, not very much money to do it with. And he was beginning to get into trouble. And uh, since he's come here, he's been through some rough patches. But um, I think, it, I feel quite satisfied that he's in the process of becoming a nice adult. For lots of reasons, I'd rather be here. You can live in your own teepee, you can do, do a lot of things for yourself. You can learn from everybody. And everyone's prepared to teach you if you want to learn. I started doing woodwork and I made a food box for my teepee. And I made a lining for the teepee as well. And I had to make the poles. And it all took time. But you just learn something like that as it comes. I felt I've learned more here than I would have done in the school in four years' time. They wouldn't tell you how to live in a teepee. They don't tell you how to look after yourself. They just tell you about how to get money. One of the things about living in a teepee is you're listening to the ground. Um, the shape of the teepee is like um, an ear trumpet or something in one of these cowboy and Indian films where you see an Indian make a cone shape with his hand and press it against the ground and say, um, there's 25 white men two miles away in the distance and one of them's riding a lame horse sort of thing. You're listening to the vib... He's listening to the vibrations of the earth and that's what it's like living in a teepee. Sometimes the sound of the river, for instance, is louder inside the teepee than outside because you're, you're in a structure that's sort of combed against the earth. It's picking up all the vibrations and you're in the centre of this energy funnel that's picking up the energies of the earth and all the sky energies. And it's all centering in the teepee. It's all coming to a focus in the teepee. You're becoming part of your environment. You're becoming absorbed into it again. As you may know, we had a, uh, a public inquiry fairly recently because the council was trying to evict us. Now, everybody, I think, that I spoke to said, what do you want to get rid of you for? You're not doing any harm. It's your own land. Um, and this seems to be the, the general reaction. People, have, uh, people in general seem to be more annoyed at the council. Um, they, they don't have any real complaints about us. Apart from, we're different. Uh, all sorts of rumours go around here. We've had everything from sacrificing babies and kittens and puppies. There was one rumour going around that we had anthrax. I think the, the farmers are scared of us. We're an unknown and people tend to be scared of unknown things. out shopping once a week or once a fortnight. So over the years we've built up quite a contact with shopkeepers. But they don't know very much about us really. Mrs. Jones in the post office was saying, when you first came, people were, you know, who are these people? What are they doing? Long haired weirdos. Uh, are we safe? Are they going to start mugging us and things? But uh, they come to accept us over the years. Um, we're a part of the community, according to quite a few people. Having been here 10 years, you fit in. I'm going to throw this stuff like crazy as well. Most of us do live on the doll. Uh, we do take state subsidy, much the same as the farmers do with sheep that are just going to form I suppose mutton mountains somewhere in the common markets. Uh, living on the dole is, is not easy. It's in fact almost impossible, I found, living in a town, in a city. 
but there, there was just too much to spend your money on. I couldn't. I don't think I could survive in a town, not on less than thirty pounds a week. But here, it's quite a comfortable amount. I can even save money on it. Yes. Have yes. I got it here? The long thin drain. That's the one. Is it? Uh, don't say I'm not. Long drain drain drain. So funny. I'd much rather get things together so that I could could be totally self-sufficient. It would be a much nicer way to live. I may be able to do it. Ideally, this place could be self-sufficient. We could grow all our own vegetable needs. Quite a few families do grow virtually all their own. They can eat for eight or nine months a year out of the gardens. <laughs> Actually, I'm thinking of selling him. What the day is like when you wake up determines what you do with that day. That's where it can be like heaven and hell. It can get quite depressing, it can get very depressing. But not for long. Do you want to eat the pig? Yeah. What pig do you want to eat today? Okay. Which one? Mine. 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 the dog pig? Fish chicky chicks, Mum. Well, I've been here a couple of years before I had Plum. When I found out that I was pregnant, it was kind of a dilemma, you know. Am I in the right situation, this and that, you know? And um, just having contact with the rest of the woman made me feel like it's OK, you know, and if there is a place to have a child, this is the best place to be, you know. I had rainbow the winter before last. And uh, as he grows older, I want to teach him to read and write. He must be able to read and write, at least so that he can make his own decision. He may not want to live here. Our children may not, in fact, want to live this life. I can't really blame them. They'd probably find it easier to live in a town. Our book bender has got a full range of... of children's books, including a whole series for learning to read. We do have little uh, reading and writing groups, you know, where one parent will take the children of maybe two or three families and do a reading session with them. see people for like two weeks, three weeks, six months, you know. People are coming and going and they live in different areas of the valley. So when you see them, it's like, yeah, it's good to get together. Yeah. This lifestyle isn't going back to some sort of pre-industrial revolution living, because that was limited as well. You know, if your father was the village blacksmith, you were the village, village blacksmith, his father was the village blacksmith. There was just no freedom of expression. This is post-industrial rural culture, 
We're individuals. We're free to express our individuality. But we're doing it with the needs of the earth in mind and not our own greeds and needs. What's important to me here isn't whether or not I can afford to pay my water rates. It's whether or not the water that's coming past my teepee, the water that I drink, is poisoned or not. The soil is important to me because I eat the food that comes out of the soil. Whereas to the majority of people, food isn't something that comes out of the soil, it's something that comes out of the, the co-op or, or the Tesco's or whatever. It's just not real, you know? It's a complete illusion. They, li they want to live in a world that's completely separate from reality, it seems. And it is, that is the way around it is. It's not us who are living some sort of idealistic dream. Two thirds of the world don't live like that. Two thirds of the world live like me. They live on the earth, dependent on the earth. One third of the world is exploiting everything else. And they're destroying the earth in the meantime. They're destroying us. When my mum came, I think she was quite impressed, you know. And she wrote and said that she thought that we were the true pioneers of the post-industrial age. It <laughs> was lovely. To leave the valley and come to Glasgow was a shock. It's a shock, a culture shock. There was a lot, a lot of pressure through the media and advertising to buy things. Buy this, buy that, you need this, you need that. It's a, it's a pressure. I mean, you begin to feel that if you don't buy it, then you're no part of the consumer community around you. But when you, when you don't earn very much, the, the idea, it makes you frustrated because maybe you want a car or you want, you know, good clothes or whatever. It's, it's really unattainable, you know. There is, there is some things about the city that, that tempt me to come back. But the, the bad things about the city outweigh them by far. It's no use, the dog can't hear you. I mean, for me, I'm a telly addict. I mean, I, I can sit in front of a television all day, you know. But that's that's one of the reasons I have to distance myself from the cities. Like, it's like all these gadgets, oh, they're fascinating, but they stop your life. I feel like you're going to go to tomorrow. So, Mary, did you see Vicky? Well, what can you wear? What have you had down your day? In the valley. Lately, in the valley. Three months of rain. Oh, Continuous rain. Just like what we've had up here. Drumming on top of the dome. Oh, Drrr. Rain, rain, rain. Oh, rain. rain. When Terry first told me he was going to the valley, I felt very disappointed. And I didn't know what was going to happen to him, what kind of people he was going to meet. But most of them are very peace-loving, and lots of them have had good jobs and gave them up to go to the valley. But I don't know if, if it's really good for him. You know, I don't know what's going to happen about her education later on. I mean, she will get an education of sorts, and she'll fit in in the valley, but when she goes to the town, you know, it'll be a different story. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring Plum up in a, in a city if I could help it, and I can, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about it. I mean, the place I, I, I grew up in was a, a, a very socially deprived area, Easter House. I lived there for 14 years, and, and it's, it was appalling. I, I don't really know what it's like now, but I can only guess that it's much the same. Very, very few amenities where a lot of people live in very close together. And, I mean, for a lot of Glasgow people in, in the schemes, it's, it's a depressing place, you know. I mean, to get away from that is a good thing, to go away into the country. I live in the land of fairy tales, TP village in a place called Wales. They take away our water and they take away our land. They break up our communities, they just don't understand that we want to breathe the air that's clean and we want to spend the day working the land of a peaceful green, away from the system that's great, away from the pump competition of submission, away from the industrial dream, away from the silence of violence that makes our young dumb and scream, away from the mass concentration of frightened and lonely souls who live and die on concrete streets aiming for material goals. Aiming for material goals. But high, high in the mountains, where the spirits are flying, listening to the wind.
crying and sighing. Back on the land is where we belong. Back to our earth, where we come from. Man, for some reason, doesn't like to see himself as part of this planet, as part of nature. And I think that's what you learn being here. That man's place is to be part of nature. I'm just as much part of this as everything is, as the birds, as the grass, as the trees, as, as all those things. We all are. But living here, you're not trying to pave it over with concrete. You're not trying to shut out the winter with a central heating and double blazing. You're not trying to scare away the night with bright lights. You're just living part of it. And that's how it should be, so it doesn't feel like a struggle. You don't feel like you're struggling all the time. Living with nature in the valley. Now, I may be wrong, but I have a sneaking suspicion that one or two of you are now muttering to yourselves, it's all right for them going on about the rest of us living in a world of unreality, but what about them? Don't they, the tent dwellers, you may say, still depend on a whole lot of services, including transport, health and social security, financed by the very system that they deplore? All of which may well be true, though it must be somewhat less depressing to be on the dole in rural Wales than in the inner city. And as the people of the valley seem to me to be innocent of ill will and to be harming no one, on this, the first Tuesday of January 1986, I wish them in their teepees, like you in your homes, a very happy new year. I'll be back again with the next edition of First Tuesday on the first Tuesday in February. Until then, good night. <laughs>